Okay, first story here on the news with a brand new pour. And I think we're going to start covering Coconut Cartel. Now, there's a website here that gave a very interesting review on a lot of different coconut rums. Now, coconut rums are kind of a very interesting uh, dynamic here in the rum world just because sometimes they actually have coconut water or some form of coconut milk into them. And other times, there's artificial flavors, kind of like the way the Malibu does theirs. They use a lot of artificial flavoring in order to kind of get that coconut feel inside of their rum. Now, that's a good cocktail maker, but I'm going to be real honest with you, it's probably not worth a buy. Now, Coconut Cartel, on the other hand, is a very different story because they're actually using very clean, very pure ingredients with no extra additives in order to make their rum. They're actually using rum aged up to 12 years. Now, that may not necessarily seem too impressive. A 12-year age statement is, is not necessarily crazy, but... What I will say is that it, it, it provides a very good balance in between the added coconut water and that, that nice, fairly simplistic, light floral rum that they use. I think it partners very well together. And if y'all are ever on the fence about trying something like that, at least know that me and several other people you know, that, that really know the, the way around the game would vouch for something like Coconut Cartel. Winning number one coconut rum, even from a fairly small outlet, is still a good accomplishment. Very good stuff, and I'm hoping to try a few more products from them coming out. Okay, next line item down the list, we're actually going to be talking about Joy Spence. Now, if y'all know who she is, you've got a leg up on most other people. Joy Spence is actually the first female head distiller for Appleton down in Jamaica. Very well respected and very liked woman down there. Now, what I'm going to say about Joy Spence is that being that she has been in this position for a very long time, she has seen a lot of trends, she has seen a lot of things come and go, and she's dealt with a lot of the BS in the rum industry. Things like dosing and, and, and bottling without being transparent and several other line items down that list. And what I think is very Im Im important to kind of highlight, and one of the things that I'm going to actually put in the description down here, is a hyperlink to the article where she was talking with a few different people, um, you know, notably the Spirits Business that covered the, the, the story kind of more in depth than a lot of other people that I've seen, uh, is that, you know, she's calling for a global or at least a very large, wide-ranging level playing field, so that way... Everybody is held to the same standard, and everybody kind of has a very um, clear understanding, getting rid of some of the the things in the rum world that a lot of us try to go after, which is not being transparent and, and things of that nature. I think it's a very good article. I think it was very well written. I went over it twice just to kind of comb through because I really wanted to understand exactly where she came from. I don't think I disagree with a single point that she made. And I think it was a very good, well-rounded article. And the, and the writing of it was actually very good. Like I said, the description of that will be down. Or I'm sorry, the hyperlink will be down in the description down below. Well, time for the next one. Hmm, that's good stuff. Okay, we're going to talk about bounce back year. Now, 2022 and 2023, in my opinion, are going to be the bounce back years for spirits in general. I think during the pandemic and especially during the lockdowns, we experienced a lot more people getting into spirits in general. Now, that being said, there probably wasn't a whole lot of people that had the opportunity to run out and go buy bottles. What I'm going to say is that the fiscal years for 2020 and 2021 weren't nothing to write home about. Even though a lot of people were getting into it, there wasn't a whole lot of surplus money going around through the economy. Therefore, alcohol sales definitely did take a little bit of a dip. Now, one of the states that I think can be credited for one of the best comebacks of the fiscal year for 2022 and starting out a boom of 2023 is actually the state of Iowa. They actually grossed $431.4 million in alcohol sales in the fiscal year of 2022, and that is being surpassed at the current moment in 2023. Now, Iowa doesn't have the most dense population, and they do have some absolutely amazing distilleries that I highly, highly suggest everybody keep an eye out on. But what I'm going to say is that just based off of the numbers that I'm seeing, it looks like 2023 is shaping up to be one heck of a good year for spirits in general. 
Okay, this next one here is just too funny to not not tell everybody. Now, a buddy of mine, Germ, uh, Freedom Malt is his channel. Go check him out. He uh, he pointed up a very interesting story that Jack Daniels is actually suing a dog toy maker. Man, you can't make this kind of thing up in 2023. Let me tell you. So they actually have this uh, this dog toy company called Bad Spaniels made a dog toy that looks exactly like the, the, the lucky number seven Jack Daniels bottle. And instead of saying Jack Daniels Tennessee Sour Mash Whiskey, it says Bad, uh, Bad Spaniels number two um, all over your Tennessee rug. Now, it's a funny little joke. I think this is absolutely hysterical. But apparently the people at Jack Daniels don't find it as funny. They're actually bringing this all the way up to the Supreme Court and trying to get this lawsuit to to go through. I, I really don't think Jack Daniels needs to do this, personally speaking. But the fact that they are so, I guess, perturbed by the decision that a dog toy company would use their likeness, that they are, are willing to go through the process to sue them. This is not the first time this company has been sued for some sort of trademark infringement. I think this Bad Spaniels company had, had a, a very, you know, funny idea and they went with it. I'm not going to fault necessarily anybody for here, but at the end of the day, I guess the, the prevailing principle is if somebody owns it and they say don't do it, just kind of don't do it. It's common sense, you know, guys? But I have to say, this is pretty funny. I'm not going to lie. Bad Spaniels, number lucky number two on your Tennessee rug is pretty damn funny. Let's go to the next one. Okay, next line item down the list is actually going to be about tequila. I don't cover tequila all too often whenever I come across something because there's really not a whole lot of outlets that are really writing and communicating about it. Now, the drink business actually did a very good job writing this article, kind of specifying some, some really good highlighted points about tequila. Now, I'm going to go into the specifications of this much later on in a different, uh, different format. But what I want to specify is that the fiscal year of 2022 was actually the best year as, as far as exportations for Mexico. Now, Mexico's number one spirit output or, or alcohol out, out export is actually going to be their beer. Mexico makes a lot of beer and they have a lot of different breweries cranking out some good stuff down there. But to be able to have the number two spirit coming out, beating mezcal, being tequila, is actually a very positive thing for the market that's getting more out that's getting more into people's hands and showing that agave just like sugarcane can be a very formidable spirit it can give you a lot of complexity it can give you a whole lot if you're willing to delve in and for some people if you can stomach that taste now tequila is not for everybody i'm fully aware of that one there but if you're curious to see a bit more of the ins and outs of the article that was written, I'm going to have it down in the description down below. It's going to be from the drink business. It's kind of a short article, but I think it gives you a lot of good key bulletin points. I didn't want to spend too terribly much time on it here, but it will be in the description. On to the next one, guys. Okay, the next thing down the list and the final bit of news here. I went scouring through the TTB to see what kind of labels were going to be approved and what we could kind of be seeing coming up here, especially in the rum world. Now, if anybody doesn't know, the TTB is actually the label approval division of the government that kind of tells you what you need to have and what you can't have on a label. There's a lot of loose interpretations on things these days and some weird stuff's been coming through, but I really want to focus on some of the cool things we have. Now, the very first label that I found, conveniently for me, was a Samaroli 29-year-old distilled in 1993 Jamaican rum. Now, I'm going to post a picture of each of these as I'm going along so that way y'all can kind of see the label. Now, this is actually a 52% ABV Jamaican rum. I'm not quite sure because I could not find any descriptions on it of which one of the stills or marks that this one is. But I'm going to tell you right now, it has been aged in Scotland, 52%, and it's my birth year. I would love to be able to get a hold of this, or at least get to try a sample. According to the label process, there was only about 273 bottles of this one that was ever produced. So the chances of me finding it's probably slim to none, but I'm still going to hunt for it anyways. Now, the next one down the list is actually from one of my favorite independent bottlers, Holmes K. 
Eric K does a very good job at, at doing his independent bottling processes. Very transparent and very awesome. Now, what I was actually able to find was a single origin reunion island, and I'm sorry if I butcher this, Grand uh, Arome, Arome is how I'm assuming it's pronounced. Sorry if I'm butchering that, really am. Rum, 46% ABV. Again, picture should be on your screen now, so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. It's kind of outside of his normal kind of color scheme and stuff, so I think this will be a very interesting rum to be able to take a look at. Next item is from a smaller distillery over in Salem, Oregon. Again, pic should be right here, but this is from D Divine Distillers. This is their Silver Inferno Unaged Rum. This is all made in-house by them, nothing sourced, no added sugar from what I can tell. Now, I don't necessarily know if I'm gonna be able to get a hold of any of this, but I'm gonna try my best to get some because it sounds like a pretty good rum based off the description and the, the feedback notes. Also, another American distillery, this time from Boise, Idaho, is actually making uh, a really cool looking rum. It's from um, uh, Barn, Barn Dene, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong, distilling. It's a 40% alcohol by volume rum. Not a whole lot of information, beautiful label. And when looking at their website, it looks like they have a very expansive selection of spirits. So kind of like the way that um, Cedar Ridge over in Iowa is also. I, I, I think that if, if their rum or if their way they operate is a very similar way to Cedar Ridge, we could be looking at an absolutely fantastic product. Well, I think that's going to be kind of it for now. We're going to wrap up this episode of rum news and bottle releases. And I hope to see everybody there on Wednesday when I go live and we try some new stuff. Like I said, no reviews. Just going to hang out and drink it. We're just going to talk rum. I hope to see you all there. Cheers, everybody. Hope your next sip is better than your last.